the whistle. There's so many elements to driving that aren't obvious. The psychology and the mindset, you know, when you see that God-given skill, it's really, really motivating. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. My guest this week is a man with a wealth of Formula One experience whose perspective on the sport is both unique and fascinating. He worked for Lotus under Colin Chapman, then Williams under Sir Frank, then Benetton alongside Flavio Briatore, only to return to Lotus with Mika Hakkinen and Johnny Herbert. The man I'm talking about is Peter Collins. Now, Peter may not be a household name, but for 20 years, he was at the epicenter of Formula One. As I've already mentioned, he worked alongside some of the great personalities in Formula One history. And that's to say nothing of the list of fabulous drivers on his CV. Peter championed and advised the likes of Nigel Mansell, Mario Andretti, Keke Rosberg, Gerhard Berger, Johnny Herbert and Mika Hakkinen, with Mika even doing the school run for his daughter Sam during his Team Lotus days. Peter experienced the highs and the lows of Formula One. There were many great victories, but there was also the gut-wrenching disappointment of having to close the doors on Team Lotus in 1994. As I said, his perspective on Formula One is unique. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Peter, it's great to see you again. It's been a while. Where in the world are you at the minute? Well, Switzerland, not too far from Bern. And, and that is home now? Yeah, I've actually been here quite a long time. I came here originally to do some uh, consulting in a indoor go-kart place, and that was going to be temporary, but 20 years later, I'm still here. Good. <laughs> and how is the indoor go-kart business? Is it going well? Oh, the, that, that one's long gone, but uh, it's interesting. You know, life takes you where you're meant to be, and uh, I probably wouldn't have moved here, made a conscious decision to move here. But, you know, that's the way it worked out. So take things as they come. And how much do you keep an eye on Formula One these days? I won't say closely, but, you know, I, I'm aware of what's going on most of the time. There's a lot of things that irritate the life out of me. Today? Or does, is that sort of a, a hangover from your day? No, today. Who's impressing you then? If we just look, look at the positives for a minute, when you look at Lewis Hamilton's record. No, it's very good. I mean, the numbers don't impress and that's no disrespect to Lewis. Numbers are only some indication. You know, there are other people with a lot of pole positions who actually I've never rated. For me, what really matters, I don't care how many poles people have, but if you see a pole position lap that is fine tingling, that is beautiful artistry, that's all that matters. And when you see that, it doesn't matter how many poles somebody has. And having the actual title of getting pole doesn't mean you haven't driven a beautiful lap. You know, Charles Leclerc drives some superb laps, but they're just not pole. And also the number of events, are there's so many more events that it skews perspective of people's careers. And, you know, if you go back to the 60s, I mean, Clark had, I don't remember the exact number, but he had 25 Grand Prix wins, I think 33 pole positions or something. And yet he only, he did, what, 10 races a year, maybe not even that. One year he didn't even do it the whole season. He missed Monaco to go into the win the Indianapolis 500. So they're the things that impress, not just numbers. Interesting. Now, look, you mention artistry and, and look, what, what pole position laps, as we're talking poles, linger in the mind, both going back from your career, because, of course, you ran teams in Formula One from, what, the late 70s to the mid 90s. So from that era or, or later, give us some poles that, that really impressed you. The ones that, that, that stick in my mind are uh, undoubtedly Senna achieved a lot of pole positions. Some of them were amazing, not necessarily because of the artistry, but because of the the intensity of what he did. Some of Prost's pole positions were unbelievable. Yeah, he, he was an artist. You never really saw when he was going quick. It, it, it was all so smooth and easy. You just couldn't believe he was so fast. Some I, I love some of Mansell's pole laps. Would you call Mansell an artist? Yes, I do, actually. I know a lot of people don't, but it depends what you're looking for. He has an unbelievable 
precision in what he does. In some ways, he's different to Prost in that Prost was so silky smooth. Nigel was smooth, but also very, very assertive in the way he, he drove the car. I thought he was exhilarating to watch. and I've always been a big fan. Well, we'll come and talk about your career in a minute. But as we're talking drivers, look, you, you mentioned Mansell. You were a big supporter, as you say. Why? What did you see in him? Incredible desire. Incredible determination. It didn't matter what equipment he had. You knew he was going to make the most of it. You know, when he had his first F1 test at, at Ricard, his first laps in the car were so late at night that you could hardly see the car. You know, the it was getting very dark and you saw the, the brakes glowing before he appeared. The car was, at that point, was semi-falling apart. It had done a full day of running and he just immediately adapted to it. So that made an impression. And every time he got in a car and had an opportunity, he took it. So his first driver, first F1 qualifying, he did the same thing in a car that really wasn't that good. But early in his career, he just, you know, you've got to take your opportunities when they come. And I think there are a couple of things, as I say, he had tremendous determination, commitment. I'm a great believer that if you have no way out, you find a solution. And Nigel had made his commitment to his career, you know, sold his house, put everything into buying a few drives in, in the F3 March in, in 80. And um, that uh, really said everything. He put it all on the line. How much persuading did Colin Chapman need to put Mansell in the Lotus? To do the test, not a huge amount. He was very open-minded in looking at people. And he knew if somebody had their opportunity and, and, and made, took advantage of it, made something of it, he knew there was something there. Every time Nigel tested before he actually tried to, to qualify at Zandvoort, he made an impression. So, for example, in mid-80, the car was really not in good shape. There was a, a test, a, a, an F1 test at Brands Hatch. I think Mario was meant to do it and couldn't come. Uh, Nigel drove for two days, and despite the expectation being very low from virtually everybody, he did an amazing job. He wrote an impressive report about what he thought about the car and what was good, what was bad, and sent it to the old man. That impressed Chapman. So another test came up. He gave him another go, and which was at Silverstone, and he impressed again. So every time he made an impression, the opportunities unfolded further. And that's the thing. You, you, when you get your opportunity, you've got to really make the most of it. And he did that. And that applies to all drivers, all, in fact, all sport. And you could argue life as well, couldn't you? Yes. Now, you mentioned Mario Andretti. How good was he in 79, the year after he won the World Championship? What impressed you about Mario Andretti? He was still very good. He had a great feel for and sensitivity for the car. And he and Chapman, when they, they were connecting, they had a great chemistry and a great understanding about what each other wanted. And he was still massively passionate about driving. And his commitment to doing the job was, was very good. And in all honesty, that first year, um, it wasn't a great year because the cars had really, they'd been at their peak the previous year and had an advantage. And then in 79, they'd really been overtaken by improved versions of the 79. I was impressed with Mario's commitment and focus on regardless of how competitive the car was, of just doing the job. He was a great guy. I really, uh, I love Mario. I think he's a tremendous ambassador. Was there anyone inside Lotus at the time who begrudged Mario the constant toing and froing across the Atlantic? Because he was still based primarily back in the States, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. And I don't think anybody begrudged that at all because they knew when he arrived, he was going to, you know, he was going to give it everything he had. In the time that I was at Lotus and he was there, which was over two years, I never saw, really saw once where he was compromised by racing in the States and racing and living in the States and racing in Europe. Did you sense that the relationship between Chapman and Andretti was Chapman and Clark part two? Did Chapman ever talk about it in those terms? Well, I don't know what part one was like, but uh, no. He had a real affection for Mario. You know, at the time, it seemed, I guess, naivety, age. 
It was in, in reality, when I arrived at Lotus, it was 11 years after Clark had been killed. So to me, it was a long time ago, but I'm sure it was actually still very, very fresh in Chapman's mind. Probably he was forever. I think in Mario, he found somebody he could communicate with, he believed in, he, he respected. But I don't think he ever formed that sort of relationship with anybody ever again. Mario was probably the closest. Was Chapman's genius still evident in those latter years? Yes, it was, because his genius was, was his, his mindset, his, his attitude. He questioned everything. He never told you how to do something, certainly not me. But he, I learned an awful lot because when I got it wrong, I knew I got it wrong. He made that very clear. But it, it was the most incredible experience to spend three years working with him, I have to say. So the genius was there, and it wasn't just in terms of conceptualizing a, a new car or or engineering the car at the track. He he had such a affirmative mind, really. It's always wonderful to hear about the incredible work of Colin Chapman, who was a bit of a hero of mine. He was a true innovator in his field, not only from a technical point of view, but also on the business side of Formula One as well. And if that's something that interests you as a budding entrepreneur currently expanding your empire, then look no further than SumUp. SumUp offers affordable and simple payment tools for businesses which are starting up or leveling up with their excellent range of card readers. Receiving a card reader is often a major milestone for new businesses as they're able to step away from cash-only payments. I know how much of a difference it makes when I don't have to think about carrying cash around with me. It's so much easier to just tap and pay by card, as I did at Silverstone at the weekend while hoovering up a few merch deals on Sunday night. It just makes good business sense to me that owners would get their hands on one of these devices. It's completely portable, has a sleek design and is incredibly user friendly and you can rely on the battery life to keep you going if you find yourself touring the festival and event circuit this summer. There's no contract, no hidden fees, just easy, flexible payments. That's why SumUp provides the simplest and most affordable range of payment and financial tools. Today, over 3 million businesses use SumUp to get paid. SumUp. Make your business official. Go to sumup.co.uk. That's sumup.co.uk to find out more. Peter, when you look back at the twin chassis of 1981, what's your first thought? Fantastic. Really? You mean fantastic? Just a fantastic experience. It was a brilliant concept. I don't think it ever had the opportunity to really be developed properly. But when I say fantastic, the whole process of building the car was just unbelievable. So we, we came back from Watkins Glen, I think, and there'd been lots of discussion about whether this car would happen. And then uh, there was a test with the 86, which was a, a sort of a Lotus 81 version with a floating body, which was very good, but it had sliding skirts, okay? So it was actually the perfect combination. But the real excitement and challenge was that we came back from Watkins Glen. It was, yeah, we're going to build a better chassis for next year because the 81 chassis wasn't very good structurally. So it went from being, yeah, well, we should really do a, an aluminium honeycomb chassis to, no, I want to do a carbon fiber chassis. So, okay. So then it was, this it didn't involve me specifically, but it was, okay, well, how do we make a carbon fiber chassis? So then there was a process of learning everything possible about carbon fiber, how you could use it, what you could do. And every single part of it, every, all the research was done at Lotus. So we made sample test pieces, which we crash tested in a very uh, easy, very original concept, but very effective. And my responsibility at that point in time also included doing the program for the build of the car. So I did a detailed program, but every time um, you thought you, you had the program under control, you'd add something else. Okay, we're going to do a carbon fiber car. Okay, we want to do it like this. Oh, now we want to do it like that. All the time, if ever, you know, you, uh, there'd always be the discussion, well, you know, that's, we're going to fall behind. And there was no concession for that. Well, you can't. You'd better find a way to do it. And he would never accept delays, even if he'd caused them. And he did cause a lot of them. But you still had to get to the target. And that was fantastic. 
great experience for you. I can see total, total nightmare to deal with in real terms. Was it because he couldn't make up his mind that he kept changing his mind? Or was it because just new ideas were just constantly coming in? I think he was constantly reviewing what we were doing and then seeing a better way or a different way or something that could give extra performance, whatever it might be. I suppose in some ways the build of the the 88, the, all the processes involved in developing carbon fibre in-house or carbon fibre construction in-house was just, it's, it was just the most exhilarating time really of a motorsport life, I would say. It was incredible. There was a carbon arms race going on between yourselves and McLaren with John Barnard and Hercules doing their thing down in Woking and you guys developing it concurrently up in Norfolk. We weren't really that aware of what Barno was doing because the car hadn't been announced. I think quite late in the piece, they unveiled the monocoque alone. But we were going down our own path. John's way was the ultimate way, and it, it had taken a lot of time, and, and it was done in a way where it was definitely structurally superior. But um, what we did was something that was, I would say, well in advance of of what anybody else did or was doing at the time. And nobody was sharing information on it, really. Okay, the carbon fibre suppliers would tell you what, what could be done, what couldn't be done. There wasn't really an awareness. It only be, We only really became aware of it as we got close to the build of the car and closer to testing it, I suppose. So the, the 88 ran at Paul Ricard, I think, mid-February 1981. And... I think that was just before the, the McLaren was presented. So two completely different approaches, but actually both very effective. And, you know, we went to Monaco with, with that car, with the 87, first time it raced. And I think Mansell put it second on the grid, which was incredible. So, you know, the, all of those sorts of things, forget whether you won a race or not. There's tremendous satisfaction in doing those sorts of things that people hadn't done before or... or you know, where you you were groundbreaking yourself. And when you think of all of the achievements you have in Formula One, be it Lotus Williams, Benetton, or when you were back running Lotus yourself, how would you sum up those Chapman years, the first Formula One team, if you like? Nothing really comes close to that. There were times that he drove me around the bend, but something he knew intimately was how to motivate people how to get them to achieve things they didn't know they could achieve. And, and that's why I learned. So I learned a tremendous amount about how to, to deal with difficult situations, how to, let's not say engineer in engineering terms, but how to plan your way out of problems. And, you know, that was absolutely invaluable. So, you know, the other things after that, Williams, Bennett and back at Lotus were all big challenges in a way. Well, certainly going back to Lotus was a big challenge. But nothing really compared to working with him and being in the team at that time. Is it true, Peter, PC, that you were on the phone <laughs> to Chapman on your wedding night? Is that true? Absolutely. You spend most of the night <laughs> trying to call him. I, I never got him that night. I kept pestering, calling the office, and he was busy. He wasn't there. He was wherever. And eventually, I think I got Andrew Ferguson and I said, you know, I'd like to talk to you about the job that's being created there. And he said, well, yes, you know, there is going to there are going to be interviews, and if you'd like to apply, you'll have to come for the interview. You know, if you want to be considered for the job. So that was about two weeks after I got married. So um, I said, okay, do you want to go to England? So we packed our bags, we sold whatever we had. We arrived with two suitcases, 150 pound, and. Uh, and a bag of LP records. <laughs> oh, brilliant. And that's, of course, coming from Australia because you, you've, you've slightly lost the Aussie twang, I have to say, over the years. Yeah, I don't think I ever had a strong one, but <laughs> it, yeah, most of it's gone, I would say. So you go from Lotus to Williams, where your team manager, what kind of a boss was Frank? How did he compare to Chapman, the previous one? The environment was completely different. Lotus and Chapman was like, like a whirlwind all the time. It was very much Frank and Patrick, and Patrick was very solid, methodical, pragmatic, excellent engineer. Frank was 
massively uh, passionate about racing and winning and had learned how to win with Patrick. So it was a it was an eye opener, to be honest. We never won a race at Lotus while I was there. So I didn't know how to win. But when I went to Williams, and when I arrived at Williams, I expected it to be perfect, you know, fantastic cars, world championships, world champions, unbelievable ground effect cars. And uh, I remember my first race meeting with them was um, Belgium Grand Prix 82. And after the first qualifying, I was in motorhome, there was going to be a... There was a very sort of informal debrief in those days, and Patrick was there, Frank was there. Keki walked in, and Keki said, the car is shit. And I thought, this is strange. You know, you're, you've set quickest time of the day on the Friday. The car is shit. It understeers like a pig. Da, da, da. And I thought, this is just very strange. And Patrick was sort of frowning and looking at him. But that was when I realized that even winning cars don't have perfect balances, you know. And that's something that I guess we'd always been looking for in, in the previous three years. Because when I arrived at Lotus, Nigel Bennett was there as chief race engineer, but he left at the end of that year. So there was, there was quite a, a turnover of, for a short period of people until we got Nigel Stroud in and things started to stabilise. So when I went to Williams, it, it was a surprise. I thought, oh, you know, winning cars, this is going to be great. So first of all, it, that was a, a surprise that the car wasn't fantastic. It was the 08, which had looked sensational in testing. Again, I thought, oh, well, this this will be, I'll see how it's done now. Quite honestly, I was shocked at the, in some ways, from a, an organizational point of view, how chaotic it was. So, um, you know, I had to find my feet. I thought everything, coming from Lotus, everything would be perfect. They've just won the world championship at Williams and, uh, you know, they've got a super quick car. And we went to the British Grand Prix and Keki qualified on pole. <laughs> Pit lane opened, went out, did his warm-up lap, went to the grid. Okay, one minute board, fire up the engines. Car wouldn't start. So pandemonium, absolute panic. Mechanics running into one another, just unbelievable chaos. So we eventually got started. He, I think he started from the back of the grid because he'd lost his pole position. And then he was undoubtedly not very happy, drove the tyres off it, almost literally, and the race was a disaster. So um, on the Monday, Frank uh, called me up and said, um, PC, um, very disappointing race meeting or something. And, you know, it's not good enough. And I said, well, I have to be honest with you. I think there's a, a lot of things that need to be documented so that we don't have this sort of disaster again. Uh, I said, if you if you let me do it, I'll do it. So I then created the operating procedure of what every single person did going to the grid, countdown to the start time and all these things. And the more I, I did like that, and the more Patrick and Frank felt comfortable, I guess, the more freedom they gave me to implement processes and procedures for how we operated the race team not engineering wise just organizationally you know but isn't that exciting that you can come into a world championship winning team and still make that much of a difference yeah it was fantastic i mean when i first arrived i felt like a spare at a wedding so for the first three or four races i i guess my mindset was a little bit well you know i've come from lotus we were pretty uncompetitive we weren't really but we weren't capable of winning races and therefore you know what do i know I'm going to see how it's done here. But then, you know, it was tremendous to have that opportunity to have an influence on things. And Keke Rosberg was there the entire time that you were at Williams. When would you say he was at his peak? Which of those seasons? It's hard to define exactly what his peak was. Incredibly brave and aggressive in and out of the car. Out of the car as well, in terms of demanding uh, as to changes he want made? or Probably not demanding, but blunt, very direct, and uh, wouldn't hesitate to tell whoever it was. So um, when I initially arrived, w when I was at Lotus, Elio Dan just used to say to me, oh, you know, you should get Rosberg. He's a really good guy. He's really quick. Not for me. So when I went to Williams and Keke was there, I thought, this is going to be interesting. So initially, we, we were sort of a bit standoffish with one another, I guess. 
and then gradually started to, uh, I guess he started to rely on me as contact a bit more and I got to know him a bit better. So then we, we got a bit closer and there was the race in Dijon where there were only a few laps to go and he was second catching Prost who was leading and um, the officials were going to throw the flag three laps early. So John Green, who was the chief mechanic, said, hey, they're going to stop the race. I said, no, 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 no. They were. So I, I went across to the little podium where the man with the flag was. And when he went to put the flag out, I grabbed his arm and pulled it down. And he tried this three times. And every time I pulled his arm away. But I think before the last one, or just after the last one, Keki passed Prost for the lead. And that really, I think, really put him in a strong position for the world championship then. That was the Swiss Grand Prix that year, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. In uh, in 82. How did you feel when the Williams family sold out at the end of last year? In some ways, relieved. Racing teams are driven by individuals. And Frank and Patrick were the spirits that drove that team. And when that combination separated, for me, it stopped being Williams to a large degree. A lot of what uh, went on in maybe in the last 10 years of Williams, it was actually quite demoralising, upsetting, however you want to call it. So in one way, it was a relief. It was a fantastic team. It achieved some fantastic things. But, you know, it's a little bit like Ferrari under Enzo Ferrari. There comes a point where the man in charge isn't the owner. And if you're not the owner, it's and unless you've got total authority to really be a dictator, I think it's difficult to, to be successful. If you look at all the great teams, I mean, Ron Dennis was a dictator, really, and it, it was his single-minded determination, vision, whatever you want to call it, that made McLaren. Somebody used to always say to me, you know, uh, when you're spending third-party money, you don't have the same care and desire and commitment that you do when it's yours. And certainly when I went back to Lotus and we had no money and I'd put all the money I had into as long as I could, you know, it drives you to never give up. And I think Patrick's departure, it was inevitable that it was going to erode, really. What about for you then? What are we, mid-85, you get a better opportunity at Benetton or what led to you leaving Williams? I'd been wanting to try and start a, a new team myself for probably 18 months with some other people. And in fact, I had this concept of a team, which was people that I'd worked with at Williams. Well, you lot were all moonlighting. <laughs> I'm, sure, no, I'm sure Frank was thrilled. <laughs> no, I wasn't. But he thought I was actually, there were two things that happened at the time. He thought I was trying to get Keki to leave. To go to your new team or just to leave Williams? No, he thought that I was trying to do something with Keki, which I wasn't. But what was really happening was that Keki was in negotiation with Ferrari and was ready to go to Ferrari. So he tried to break the contract by driving in a, an almost uh, pathetic manner in testing. Um, but Frank thought that was me. So we nearly had a separation at that point. What's that? That's pre-season 85, are we talking there? I think it was end of 84. And 84 had been a terrible year. Keki happened to ring the day before it was probably going to be major confrontation and said, OK, Frank, I'm staying. So the meeting I had with, that I was going to have with Frank the next day uh, changed completely. Then there was a sort of a clearing of the air because things had been quite stressful for everybody. And there was a, you know, Frank said, OK, we know, we've got to do a better job next year. You've got to do a better job. Patrick's got to do a better job. And we all actually did that. And then things improved greatly And 85 started off as a very good year. But Frank had also wanted me to sign a contract for three years or something. I didn't think that the money for that period was correct. I said, I'd, I declined. And he said, um, oh, you said, I'll, I'll pay your signing bonus. No. I said, that's it's one off. In the end, he said, well, PC, it's up to you contracts there if you want it. He said, you know, they're going to leave. So I said, okay, whatever. Anyhow, I didn't sign. When I first came to England, and didn't get the job at Lotus. I worked at Rolt Cars. Ron Taranak. Yep. I started off on the workshop floor making 
parts list for cars, for car builds, but I actually did that pretty badly. So then I got moved into the stores, which I hated, but I also did that quite badly. And then at one point I sold somebody some Formula Atlantic wishbones when I should have sold them Formula 3 wishbones. So then Ron said, ah, ah, no, drive the van. So then I became van driver, which is fantastic because I learned, you know, I found my way around London, delivering stuff, collecting stuff. I also learned what van drivers get up to. So um, it was a very strange thing. But when I was at, at Rolt, I'd met Rory Byrne. He was there doing the Tongman Rolt. And uh, we chatted a few times and got on quite well. And then obviously he went off and did Formula 2, then did the Flying Pig, etc. But I always got on well with him. So uh, I'd heard that, that Bennett and were going to be buying Tongman. And... Um, Sort of May, I think, Rory approached me and said, how would you feel about coming to uh, to work at Tolman Bennett and are buying it? And they want somebody to run it. So, okay. So it sounds interesting. They came up with an offer. I did a deal. But Peter, you're never going to leave Williams. Well, that was the funny thing. <laughs> at Imola, there was a bit of a chat going on with one of the Honda guys and Frank and myself. And I made some joke and he said, oh, PC, you're such a fool. Why didn't you sign that contract? I said, because I'd only sign it if I'm, I'm going to honour it. Oh, he said, you're never going to leave Williams. And a week later, <laughs> I resigned, which didn't go down very well. What happens when you resign from a team like Williams? Does Frank say, right, clear your desk, you're out now? Or does he make you work out a notice period? Well, with people in the in the engineering department and the design office, they were they were given a cardboard box and sent down the road the next day, which is what happened to to I think to Ross Braun. And I I had hoped that Frank would say, okay, well, you know, work your notice out. Now, theoretically, I was meant to give two weeks, but he he got quite stroppy. He said, you can't leave, you can't leave until you found somebody to replace you. You know, I, that, I'm not obligated. You owe this to me. I gave you the option. Blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, so I stayed on and I uh, suggested a couple of people and he accepted one. So I spent time teaching that guy what to do, how I operated, how as a team manager, what you did. So I was able to leave. And I, I think I, my last race was Detroit 85, which we won. And I got back to England. I left at the end of that week. I think it was 4th of July. I started at Benetton. That's an interesting subject you've just raised there in that team manager can mean different things in different teams. What part of the job did you enjoy? Well, well titles mean nothing. I mean, everybody's a, a team principal or a technical director, or whatever these days. It actually means nothing. The only thing that really matters is what you do. In terms of team manager, I believe the old team manager is the current team principal. So you're looking at, at a way forward for the team, how to optimise the efficiency of the people you've got working for you, what processes you can employ at races to make things easier to operate or reduce you know, downtime. So it's organisation and planning, and I'm a great believer in processes and procedures. Also at Williams, after that Brands Hatch thing, I, I wrote a procedure for radio communication because we were the first team to run a radio in, in Formula 1, 1982, uh, Italian Grand Prix. We had bought radios from IndyCar, IndyCar supplier, and fitted them in the car and ran them at Monza. You know, there was a whole education process to go through as to what the procedure was, because initially, you know, people press the button and talk at the same time. You can't do that. You've got to press the button, leave a very short gap for the airwaves to clear, and then you can talk. Otherwise, you, you clip the conversation. So um, the thing I loved doing was writing procedures, operational procedures. It didn't matter whether it was the pit board or how the things would be laid out in the garage or communication, whatever. What was that radio like at Monza in 82? You know, when the car was at the farthest point of the racetrack, you're at the Lesmos, all the trees between the, the pit lane and, and, and that bit of the racetrack. <laughs> was it a bit like, <laughs> could you actually hear anything the drivers were saying? Yeah, we didn't have great range, but then we didn't have a repeater. And, you know, it was all very new to us. So I think myself and Neil Oakley did it really with the guys from the US. We didn't have great range, but we had clear communication from the parabolica to the chicane. And, you know, that was useful. 
I mean, I, I wouldn't have said it was strategically critical in that race, but it got it started. And the following year, we had radios in all the cars and, and regular communication. How tough was Formula One in those days? Because the all-nighter was a regular thing at races back then, mm. wasn't it? Which it's not yeah. now because we have a curfew and all that kind of thing. How physically and mentally draining was this sport back then? I think it was physically very demanding. Mentally, it was, it was such a good atmosphere overall. For me, it was. At my age, I, you know, it was what I'd wanted to do from the time I was at school, really. But the interesting thing is when I went to Lotus, we had the travelling crew, which included myself and, and Nigel Bennett, was 12 or 13 people. And the, the total team was about 45. I think there was a, one mechanic on each car, a, a number one, and at races we had floating mechanics who assisted and we had a gearbox guy, tyre man, et cetera. But the mechanics who did the, uh, who, who were the number ones on the cars, they also did all the testing, all the testing, and there was no limitation on testing in those days. So it, it, it was very demanding, but it was, um, I think the difference was that then the individual was um, a critical part of the, the, the operation. He wasn't somebody working in a baked bean factory, if you know what I mean, on the production line. You actually contributed. The adrenaline that gave you really prompted you to, or it didn't prompt you, but it drove you to just not consider the, the difficulties or the fatigue. There was never enough time. So you go to Benetton, 1985, and what do you find there? As you said, your, your old mucker Rory Byrne is there. Suddenly the Italian lira is flowing in, and the team was quick on occasion, wasn't it? They hadn't been that year. They were the previous year. The early part of 85 was an absolute disaster because the car never qualified, if it qualified at all, never qualified above 18th or something. So my first race was the French Grand Prix and it qualified 18th. What were the main issues with the car? Honestly, the car <laughs> wasn't an issue. The, the ca chassis was brilliant. Teo Fabi did a, a fantastic job. It was very, very quick. The engine was probably a bit of a... a handicap in terms of power it was very good structurally and um and weight but not the most powerful but as a package it was a very good car but there was absolutely zero pre-planning or organization of how to do anything i i literally did nothing that first race i just watched i observed watched what people did when they did things there was no plan for qualifying nothing Oh, qualifying's on. Yep, put some tyres on, sending them out. So I think we, we came back from that race and I, I had something like 200-point job list of things that needed to be addressed. A few technical things, a lot of organisational things. So we'd qualified 18th. We ran out of fuel three laps from before the end of the race, which was just ridiculous. Rory wasn't there. He was already, I think, working on, on the next car. So the big push for the next race was to actually get organised. So again, lots of writing of job descriptions and accountability and procedures. And we went to Silverstone, qualified ninth. And then I think three weeks later, went to Nürburgring, qualified on pole. Now, that was the same car, an engine and driver. For sure, Pirelli helped with qualifying because the tyres are good but they'd had Pirelli before that. So the biggest thing was just changing the operating procedures and, and disciplines. Maximising what you've got. Yeah, and they hadn't been doing that, and no disrespect to them. They'd never had anybody to learn from or, you know, organise them, really. Tremendous potential, and that was the reason I actually went there, because I knew Rory was good. I'd been told by Stephanie Johansson how good the chassis was. So when the opportunity came up, I went. There was a, a funny incident just after it, it became public knowledge that I was going there. It was just before the Canadian Grand Prix. I went to Heathrow and I was standing with talking to the guy who, you know, had all the the, the charter tickets. And uh, Jackie Oliver walked up 
And he said hello to us both. And he looked at me, he said, well, you're a fool, aren't you? I said, why is that, Jack? Well, you must be an idiot to leave, Frank. Well, I said, you know, I like a challenge. Well, you never do anything there. So uh, there was a lot of pleasure when we won in Mexico the following year with a BMW engine, which Jackie had had for two or three years. <laughs> true, true, yeah. And of course, Gerhard, that was Gerhard Berger, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. How did you find Gerhard, actually? Was he underrated as a driver? I think he was very talented. I don't think he optimised his abilities. You know, he was a great guy, big balls, and drove hard. In many ways, classic Austrian. In a way, looking back, I think he had success too quickly. Possibly the worst thing that happened to him was that he, he was able to go to Ferrari, spend one year with us and then go to Ferrari. And, of course, I'm sure he was paid well, Ferrari driver, and I don't think that helped him. Something I, that I saw in Mansell, you know, the harder up you are, the tougher life you've been through and the, the less money you have, the greater the determination and desire to make something happen. Gerhard came from a reasonably comfortable background, I think. And I think then it became very comfortable when he went to Ferrari. What about the whole Flavio Briatore thing? I don't know exactly when Flavio came into Benetton, but it seemed a bit of a, from the outside at least, a bit of a revolving door situation. He comes in and you leave. Was it a case of him or you? Well, certainly from my perspective, it was him or me. And it had started in late 88. We'd had a very good year, you know, had a lot of results, finished third in the world championship, which of course we'd been told we'd never do. And I think our budget that year was eight and a half million pounds and Ferrari, Williams, McLaren were like 40 million pounds, I think. So we'd achieved a lot. But from what I understood, Flavio had friends who wanted him to be involved at Benetton and there wasn't in the main company, but Apparently, he wasn't welcomed by a lot of the people involved. So the Formula One team became somewhere to, to put him. And we ha had a meeting with Luciano and his son and um, Flavio in London. Well, I went to see them and Flavio was there in, I think, November of 88. It was explained to me that, you know, Mr. Benetton would like to have an Italian influence or presence I said, well, what does that mean? So they said, oh, well, you know, just that he can report back to us and blah, blah, blah. I said, no, but this isn't your team. I said, no, it's not my team, but if you want Mr. Briatore, then you don't need me. That was a fairly frosty meeting, and, and so it went quiet for about three months, and then I had a call from somebody else connected with Ben, and, well, you know, Mr. Mr. Briatore, you would be very helpful to have him in the team. I said, no, then you really don't need me because I'd seen these things before of people who didn't know, thinking they knew. And I also had a, I'd been given um, a rundown of his CV by a friend who, which told me a lot about his past. I wasn't interested in his style of business. Let's put it that way. I then had a visit from Benetton's lawyer in February saying, um, you're an employee. I said, I'm very aware of that. Well, Benetton would really like Mr. Briatore to be involved in the team. So they would like him to do the marketing. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I know what that means. So I was really put in a position where he, he was going to come, supposedly only doing merchandise, merchandise and a bit of marketing. But I knew what that meant. So uh, at that point, I, I'd already decided if he started to really politic, then this wasn't my future. And that's exactly what happened. So my methods of operation are completely different to, let's say, uh, Flavio's business ethics. Before we move on, actually, can we just talk about Johnny Herbert? Um, because a bit like uh, Mansell, you championed Johnny um, big time. And what made you pursue Johnny after that Formula 3000 accident? Because anyone who's seen the footage or who was there at Brands Hatch in 1988 will know the extent of the injuries to Johnny's feet. What made you still believe? My real passion was the art of driving. And when I was growing up in, in Sydney, 
you know, the Tasman series would come every year. And I was very lucky to be able to be in the paddock area and be able to watch Clark, Rint, Rodriguez, you name it, you know, almost standing by the side of the track. Those guys had something very special, particularly in in that period. If they lived, they had something very special and they had special skills to survive. The first time I saw Jackie Stewart, it was clear how, how talented he was. And Clark was just, you just never saw the speed. It was just there. You never saw, the car was never out of control. He was so totally in control of it, everything, even when it was out of control. I, I realised pretty early in the piece that there were drivers who drove racing cars quite quickly and then there were racing drivers who had special skills. I had been watching Johnny for a couple of years in Formula 3 and then we tested him in the Benetton. And at Brands Hatch on the short circuit, he was absolutely sensational. In 30 laps, he went quicker than, than Terry Bootson and was as quick as Mansell, who was there in the Williams Honda. First time in a 1,000-horsepower car at Brands Club Circuit. Not easy. So that convinced me of what I thought I'd seen in Formula 3. Rightly or wrongly, I look at a grid and I see 20 to 30% of artists and 70% of people driving racing cars. Still talented, but not exceptional. So when Johnny had the accident, my mindset was, you know, it was quite late in the piece and it was, well, who else is available? All the people that were available at that time were being pushed at us. They were, I either thought they were past their peak or they didn't have anything special. So my, my thinking was, uh, Johnny was a diamond as a comparison. It had been scuffed a bit, but if the sparkle was still there, try and rescue it. There's no doubt the accident cost Johnny over the period of his career, injury, pain, whatever. But also it took something, he lost something in that accident. What, some of that sparkle that you referred to? Something special disappeared. And um, it's something you, you'd never get back. But at the end of it, he was still an incredibly good racing driver. And his first Grand Prix showed that, even with his legs in terrible condition. When I looked at the options, and I, it was the same mentality when I went back to Lotus. You know, there were lots of people who, who had experience, but had either never been really quick or past their peak. And I remember at the time being asked, you know, why, why are you taking Mika Hacken? He's, he, he's a Formula 3 driver. I said, because he'll be quick. I know he's quick. Yeah, but he has no experience. Simple thing. He has no experience, but he's quick. Do you think it'd be better to take somebody with a lot of experience who isn't quick and is never going to be quick? You can teach somebody experience. You can't teach them speed. So that was the principle of continuing with Johnny. And I don't regret it, to be honest. And I, I honestly feel that the push by Flavio to remove Johnny in mid-89, and it was beyond my control at that point, really. But the principle was proven to be correct because there was no great change in performance when they changed drivers. In fact, Johnny scored points on a regular basis and always finished races. So that that was the rationale behind it. But also the, the belief that there was something special still. You know, you don't win Grand Prix. It doesn't matter what car you're sitting in if you haven't got some skill. And he still had it. Okay, now you've mentioned Mika Hakkinen. My first question to you about him is, was Mika the fastest racing driver you ever worked with? One of. Ah. Definitely one of. It's a very fine line between who's the fastest and not the fastest. It varies. From all the people I saw race, the fastest I ever saw was Jim Clark. I think Mika was incredibly fast. It's quite interesting you bring him up because if you think about it, why did Ron persist with Mika after his accident in Adelaide? He obviously saw something special, knew there was something special there. Mika's qualifying ability was phenomenal. The biggest problem for me with Mika initially was that he was not very disciplined, didn't work hard enough at his fitness, but just in natural skill, amazing. And I, I'm a great believer that Scandinavian drivers have a, a car control built into them, which Southern or other people don't have, you know. It's maybe because they walk on ice from the day they're born. Didn't Mika live with you for a while? Couldn't you shove him out the door and send him for a run or something? No, he, um, we, we had a house in Wyndham because we were, there was a group of us who moved there 
And so we had this house, I think it had three or four bedrooms. So we had Mika, Nigel Stepney, my daughter, my wife, myself, um, Greg Field, and there was somebody else at one point. It was actually a lot of fun. But Mika, Mika's, one of Mika's jobs to keep him busy so he didn't sleep all day, he used to have to pick my daughter up, take her to school, and also pick her up from school. So quite often he turned up at her school in his baby grove with bunny rabbits on it, but with a, you know, a Marlboro jacket or something over the top. Fastest school run ever. Yes, exactly. Well, actually, what is it like to live with a professional racing driver? You know, you say to stop him sleeping during the day, but are they wired differently to normal non-racing drivers? They're all different. I love Mika. He was a great young guy. And, but he was very, very totally unaffected. In September of, of I guess, 91, we were all still in that, that house. And my, my wife and daughter had moved up during the, the school holidays. And uh, <laughs> we had some friends who had children my daughter's age from when, we, um, when we'd lived up there previously. So my wife organised a birthday party for Sam and her, you know, three or four of her friends. And um, Mika joined in the birthday party <laughs> and was sitting at the kitchen table, you know, eating the birthday cake. He's a lovely, lovely guy. And he and my daughter gone very well, you know, 10, 12 years apart. It was a great time. A lot of fun. Conjures up brilliant images. Now, look, talking of another, uh, another image of Mika Akinen, can you tell us the story of when you had to pull him out of jail? I think it was jail prior to the 1992 British Grand Prix. Well, there wasn't actually that much to it. I mean, he and, and Johnny were supposed to uh, would, would share the car. You know, they've been told what time warm up is and all the rest of it. So this is race day for the, for the yeah. British Grand Prix. No, actually, they didn't share a car because Johnny arrived in time. But Mika had no concept of traffic jams. So he was stuck in traffic, knew that the warm-up was coming up, decided that he had to take a bit of a shortcut down the hard shoulder. So he got stopped and arrested and taken to the little police hut at the circuit. So then I got a call. I, I'm with the police. So, so we we had to go across and have him released. And uh, he missed the warm-up, but... We got him in time for the race. He did miss the warm-up. They kept him long enough to miss the warm-up. Yeah, yeah. Crikey. Now, look, this is obviously all during your time at Lotus uh, for the second time, effectively, which, uh, where you were between 1990 and 1994. How big a step up was it for you from team manager to, what were you, managing director, running the show? It's, it's actually, it's a very interesting scenario because at Williams, I was racing manager. So I ran the race team and there'd be times when when there'd be strategic decisions about, you know, engines or what we were going to do or drivers or whatever, which Frank and Patrick would make and other political decisions along the way. And I remember at the time I used to think, oh, what on earth did they make that decision for? How stupid. And of course, what I didn't know was all the things they did know. You know, I wanted to, to really run a team. And when I got to Benetton, that's really what I had to do because Benetton fundamentally paid the bills and I kept them informed of what we were doing. But I ran it on a day-to-day basis as though, I won't say as though it was my own team, but, you know, I took all the decisions. You know, that was really a step up and I'd learned a lot from Frank and Patrick. I mean, effectively what I did when I went to Benetton I drew on all the experience of, of, you know, working with Chapman, Frank, Patrick, all of those things. I'd learned a tremendous amount from Chapman on how to view things and not rush into decision and not let emotion get you to make the wrong decision. So when I went to Benetton, that's really what I did. Then when Lotus came up after that, the biggest difference when I went back to Lotus wasn't anything to do with structuring the team or setting down procedures. The most difficult thing, which I hadn't had to deal with previously, was where you get the money from. So when I arrived, we had nothing. We had enough to get a deal done with the family. We had got some funding to buy some old Judd engines from Brabham. And 
we had probably enough money for, um, I don't know, a month or something. What happened to all of the RJ Reynolds tobacco money of the previous year? God knows. I mean, it all spent from what I understand. But there was nothing there. I mean, when, when we first arrived, you know, there were, there were light bulbs that were dead and been dead for ages and never changed. This is Ketteringham Hall in Kettering Hall, yeah. Yeah. And I think there was a mentality just run it for the minimal cost, you know. Once, you know, emotion and passion make you do stupid things, we blindly committed to buying it without any real guaranteed income. So the first thing I did was um, actually something very interesting happened. We were, we were contacted by a guy from Tamiya who I had met at Benetton who, when, when they did a Benetton model. He contacted me and he said, uh, you know, Mr. Collins, Mr. Tamiya would like to support you in what you're doing. We've had a good relationship before. Um, we will sponsor the car for a reasonable amount of money. And that was the, f- the first key bit, okay? wasn't going to get us too far, but that gave me the idea. He'd, he had done this and, and Tammy had done it because they had such a, a love of the Lotus name from even back from when they did their first model of the Lotus, you know? When I, I finally realized, okay, we haven't got anything to sell. All we've got is a name and um, history. Just after we, we bought the team, the Gulf War started and business shut down. I figured the only thing we had to sell was Colin Chapman. Bought a plane ticket or two, went to Japan and met with lots of people. I had somebody, Kenny Wapshot, who helped me tremendously in that. And uh, I sold the spirit of Colin Chapman. And they said, oh, why are you doing this? Well, you know, I worked with Colin Chapman. He taught me everything. I want to repay him. His spirit lives on. Ah, his spirit lives on. And that was how we ended up with so many Japanese sponsors. Funny, we're, we're ending where we started, really, with Chapman, aren't we? And um, was his death in December 1982 one of those moments where you can still remember exactly where you were when you heard? Yes, I, um, I remember where I was. I mean, I'd left by that stage. I'd been gone for a year. And the odd thing was we had a, a little bust up at the end of 81 and um, I decided to leave. We had a bust up. He said, well, you'll have to go. I said, okay, I'm going. Then I had some calls. Well, you know, it was all a bit silly. We should talk, come back. So I went back for about a month and the structure that had changed and the people involved was something I knew I couldn't work with. So I found an alternative and I went and said to him, you know, I'm, I've come to tell you what I told you I would do if, if I wasn't happy, I'm going. He got quite upset left me standing in his office by myself, stormed out. And um, the next few times I saw him at races, he, he blanked me completely. And then uh, in the second part of the season, he started to, you know, hello, how are you, as we passed. And then at the last race in Vegas, it was, oh, Peter, how are you? You know, you should come and see us sometime. And uh, how's everything going? What are you doing? I was pleased that had happened when I heard that he died because we'd had a very good relationship overall. It was unfortunate, really, that it had got it was soured a little bit. So I was pleased that I'd actually had those conversations with him. So you've sold the Chapman dream, particularly in Japan, and that car was good, wasn't it? I mean, Hakkinen finished fourth in Hungary. And I remember now I look back and think, you know, there were the seeds, the shoots to be really confident for the future. Why, when you look back, do you think it didn't happen? It's very simple. This is money. The, the car was quick. Mika and Johnny drove it very, very well. But we had no money. So not only couldn't we develop it very quickly, um, reliability was an issue. I mean, at the end of the day, we finished fifth in the world championship that year. And the general reaction was, well, hmm, it's no great achievement because we hadn't won a race, of course. And you should, you're Lotus. But if you did that today, no matter what you name you had on the car, you finished fifth in your second year, you know, running a team effectively your own, people would be saying what a great job you'd done. I mean, we finished, I think, eight points behind Ferrari in the world championship that year. We had the same budget that year as we'd had at Benetton in 88. Eight million pounds. Yeah. I wonder what Ferrari was spending in 1992. <laughs> to think. Yeah. So it was money. And but interestingly, one of your sponsors was 
Lawrence Stroll. And given what he's gone on to uh, invest in in Formula One and his commitment to the sport, were there any conversations with him about trying to help keep things going? Yeah, we, we actually got on very well and, and he helped us quite a lot. But it was still very early days for Tommy Hilfiger. He often talked about wanting to do more, but I think it was the wrong time of life for him, business life for him. He was still building his wealth and his businesses. So the two things just never came together at the right time. You know, life is about timing and luck. We, we didn't have the timing. And how much did Pedro Lamy's crash, testing crash at Silverstone in 94 sort of, was that another nail in the coffin, just the cost of that accident? Because it was, I mean, it was a horrendous crash, wasn't it? I wouldn't have said it, it was really another nail in the, the coffin. Maybe it, it accelerated the burial, the death. I would have said, you know, at the time we had lots of discussions going on about the future, which were, were genuine, but if they didn't happen, there was no future. I'm sure you've read the, the bit about Monza 94 and the accident at the first corner. That was the nail in the coffin. Because if we'd had the race we could have had, I think well, there were definitely discussions based on Monza goes well, everything will be fine. But it didn't. So again, timing and luck. And how helpful was Bernie Ecclestone? Well, clearly not very, given what happened. But I mean, did Bernie try and help? He was actually pretty good. It's interesting. I mean, I had, I've, I had a few disagreements with him during my time at Benetton because Benetton was aligned to the Ferrari sort of political position. But first of all, when I went to Lotus, I had a conversation with him. He said, what do you think you're doing there? He said, you should just let it die. I said, well, you know, I owe it to the old man and uh, we want to try and do it. So after that initial resistance, he actually became quite helpful. So he never gave us stuff, but he did advance us money to, to help with cash flow. But it was money that was due to us. I have to say, he, I feel he was very positive and helpful overall. That experience with Lotus, did that leave a, a very bitter taste in your mouth? And it, is that why one of the reasons why you didn't get back involved somewhere else? No, um, it didn't leave a bitter taste. I guess the way my mind works, with right or wrong, I can't work for somebody that I don't respect or I think is going to be doing stupid things, telling you to do stupid things. I can't do that. I actually had a, a, an approach from a couple of people. that was just no way I wasn't going to go and work for them because they, I didn't feel they knew what they were doing. It was a conscious decision not to run teams again. And, you know, it, that period, I mean, the 15 years I was in Formula 1 took a lot out of me, a lot out of my family life. And um, I remember in 1988 in Detroit, there was a, a team principal who had a birthday party and he was probably 10 years older than me at the time. And I remember saying to my wife, I don't want to still be doing this job at that age and still behaving like a child. So uh, I want to get out while I'm, I still have some passion for it. But I didn't know when that would be. But again, the time came and the time was right. And in, in a roundabout way, I then sort of got back to probably my primary love, which is the art of driving. And finding young drivers, not necessarily. I always have always worked with people who never had the money, but I thought had the talent. So that's, that's how it evolved. And I find that massively, massively satisfying because there's so many elements to driving that aren't obvious the psychology and the the mindset and the you know when you see that god-given skill it's really really motivating and that's what you're doing now with all in sport yeah i consult advise kick do whatever's necessary if and when i find the right person you know so i don't know how many more of those they're likely to be i'm, I'm getting a bit old what an amazing chat thank you very much for your time just to bring it up to the current, last question from me is, I know you say you're not following Formula One as obviously as closely as you used to, but go on, who's going to win the World Championship this year? Uh, you, hmm, you've opened a can of worms there because I think it will either be Lewis Hamilton or, or Max Verstappen. 
And the reason I say that is because they're, both teams have competitive cars and are very driven to win. Both are very good drivers. There are other people who could be contenders if they were sitting in a car that was more competitive. You're effectively looking at the two camps. For me, I think the most strategic thinking team, no, maybe the, the most strategic thinking person in Formula One today, and I have tremendous respect for him, is Helmut Marker. When you know what Helmut's life has been and his career has been, you understand the man. And he is a winner. Matterschitz is a determined man and has the budget. Adrian Newey is very, very clever. Brilliant. Mercedes, I see a lot of, and Hamilton, I see a lot of disruption. And it takes very little disruption or loss of focus to lose the winning edge. So probably doesn't answer your question. It does. I think you're saying Max Verstappen. <laughs> He's very, very good. But there's still things he, very small things that can play into whether you win a championship or not. Lewis has it, has had it, knows it exactly. Max, there are still some things, very subtle things that need to be added to his repertoire. At this moment, I, I rate Lewis as a, a probably just a little bit more complete driver. And the thing that has impressed me most about him in, in the, over the last probably three years are the races that he's won in a car that didn't deserve to win races. Unbelievable. Emotional control, management of the resources of the car, just phenomenal. And then, you know, that beautiful skill as well. It'll be an interesting year. Peter, many thanks. Thank you. It's been wonderful to chat. Good to see you again. Good to talk. All the best. My goodness, there was a lot in that chat. I learned so much about the likes of Chapman and his modus operandi, and I loved Peter's story about telephoning Colin on his wedding night. It's not as you mean to go on and all that. You can also tell that Peter is someone who really understands drivers. His analysis of the greats, such as Andretti, Mansell and Hakkinen, was both in-depth and fascinating, as was his insight into Lotus, Williams and Benetton of 30 years ago. Who knew that Williams were the first team to race pitster car radios at Monza in 1982? Peter, many thanks for your time. It was great to catch up and I hope to see you again at a race soon. And before we move on, as ever, please send in any stories or thoughts that you have on Peter. We always get loads of feedback about anything from the 1980s or 90s. And I can't wait to see what you come up with this time. And remember, I'll read out the best ones next week send them to me at Tom Clarkson F1 or use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Which brings me on to what you sent in about Charles Leclerc after last week's show. He came across so well, didn't he? And boy, did he drive well at Silverstone over the weekend. Jao Paolo sent this in. A shiver ran down my spine as Charles Leclerc's celebration on the radio after his win at Monza. As a young engineer from Brazil, I dream of being part of Charles's team someday. Thank you so much for an amazing pod. Well, João Paulo, João Paulo from Sao Paulo, perhaps. Thanks for the note. And yes, that radio celebration was very special. And if anyone at Ferrari is listening, please look out for João's TV when he sends it in. Tim Kaufman had this to say. I will never forget watching him storm back to P1 in Bahrain in 2017 in Formula 2. It was then that I realized I was witnessing someone special on track. So humble, so talented. All the best for Charles. Well, thanks, Tim. And you weren't wrong, were you? Charles is indeed very special. And how about this from Sam? A brilliant episode with Charles. Thank you for the piano and paddle insights. I loved the episode as a whole, and it was really nice to hear him speak about his amazing 2019 season. I would love to see him fighting at the front again next year. Well, hang on, Sam. What about seeing him fight at the front in the second half of this year? Ferrari seem to be edging closer, don't they? Anyway, we'll end with this one from Sava, who says, I'd love to play chess against Charles, as I've also started picking up some old hobbies, such as chess and hopefully soon, piano. Great hobbies to have, and I can see where he's coming from, competitive in chess and relaxed with music. Good luck, Charles. 
Well, we'll have to fight over that, Sabo, because I'd like to play chess with Charles too, and Paddle for that matter. Now, folks, we're going to leave it there. And I'm sorry if I haven't read out your message. Thank you to everyone who sent them in. And I have read them all, I promise. Well, that's it for another week. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Peter Collins. And remember to send in your thoughts and stories on him. And as ever, I'll be back next week with another great guest from the world of Formula One. So see you then. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audio Boom. Until next time, keep it flat out. <laughs>